Coming up next on Headline Humboldt, the Eureka City Council this week received an update on its efforts to fight homelessness while also establishing a new housing fund. We'll have the details. Also, Jan Bramlett and Cindy Sutcliffe from the Child Abuse Prevention Coordinating Council of Humboldt County join us to talk about child abuse in Humboldt County and what's being done to address this issue. Coming up now on Headline Humboldt. From the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk, thanks for joining us. When you're a parent, as many of you know, you become an expert at monitoring your child, both their relative happiness as independent individuals and in trying to gauge how the wider world is impacting them. Children are impressionable, subject to the whims and attitudes of those adults around them, as well as their broader community of peers and playmates. They face all this while trying to navigate a very complicated and often traumatic wider world. While each child is an absolutely unique and miraculous personality all by themselves, they also form a vivid reflection of the world and people from which they've sprung. In most families, most of the time, that means they'll have the same accent as their parents. They'll often use the same descriptive words and labels for things, and they'll process emotional events in the same manner they observe in their parents and siblings. But when children are abused, they absorb all that pain and negativity, process it as best they can, and then, if not helped by society, they can become transmitters of that same emotional frequency in their dealings with the wider world. This is part of what we need to prevent. If a society can be judged by how it treats its most vulnerable citizens, that's precisely the subject of tonight's show. How do we treat the homeless? Are we trying hard enough to fix the issues that lead to people being unhoused? And our kids, whatever befalls our kids, good and bad, becomes our future. And in an age where the impossible seems more and more likely through cultural conditioning, scientific advance, and technological intervention, have we done enough to protect our own kids from the agony of abuse and thereby secured our own collective futures? Jan Bramlett and Cindy Sutcliffe from the Child Abuse Prevention Coordinating Council of Humboldt County will join us to talk about child abuse in Humboldt County and how their organization is working to protect the innocent. But first, the news. Council members heard an update on the city's Homeless Action Plan, an initiative meant to help the city address homelessness. The council received a report from staff on the 24-page document approved in 2022. By providing more affordable housing units, expanding outreach, and working closely with community groups bent on tackling homelessness, such as Uplift Eureka, the city hopes to make progress on an issue that has proven intractable in recent years. Just mostly a comment. I just wanted to... Thank you, as well as everybody else that's, you know, putting all this effort and energy into it. Um, I don't think I knew very much about this prior to being, I knew a little bit about what the city was doing prior to being elected, but to really kind of have a much closer view of just how much um, energy and effort and dedication is going into really helping a very vulnerable population. Um, it's, I think, in, um, inspiring, and I just really appreciate it. And uh, I think it's really impressive because some of the stuff that the city is doing is not things that the city has to do, but it is stuff that is being done. And with us being kind of the county seat, so many of the um, challenges land here. And I'm just uh, appreciative and want to thank staff, um, all of you who are working with um, the community that's gathering into Eureka that needs help. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you. The council also decided to establish the Eureka Housing Trust Fund, which is to be seeded with $500,000 from the American Rescue Plan, money that was allocated to the city by the federal government. The city will also dedicate $100,000 per year to the program from transient occupancy taxes collected through vacation dwelling units. The money could potentially be used for first-time homebuyer programs, loans, and grants. It could also be used to fill funding gaps for future affordable housing projects. Joining me now in studio is Jan and Cindy from the Child Abuse Prevention Coordinating Council of Humboldt County. That's a lot of sil syllables, but uh, I think I got it okay. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Good, thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks yes. for having us here. Uh, no problem. Thank you guys for the work that you do. Um, so it's a long title, but it does really necessary, important work. I'm a parent. Um, I'm also in a big family. I'm around a lot of kids a lot of the time, and I see what trauma and trouble can do for, for young minds. And uh, 
young um, you know, identities. So um, let's first sort of start with Humboldt County's abuse situation. Um, where do we rank in terms of you know, the counties of the state and how, how is that problem looking right now for residents of Humboldt County? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, from your, for your, you know, your introduction was really eloquent. And one of the things that um, we're looking at is there are allegations of child abuse and then there are substantiations of child abuse. Absolutely. And that is allegations are responses to, they're, they're the number of reports, the number of reports that come into the child welfare system. Then the investigations by the child welfare system are, are conducted and they decide whether the problems arise to the level of having to bring the child into foster care. Intervention or removal. Yes, uh, yeah. and that would be substantiation. Okay. The difference between the number of allegations and the number of substantiations in Humboldt County particularly is very, very big. It, across the nation, it's actually a huge yeah. range, um, which means that people are over-reporting yeah, abuse makes, and neglect. Is that a matter of people f having different ideas about parenting, or what would you say? That could be part of it. It's yeah. also the definition of neglect that people are going by, ah, okay. and the definition of uh, uh, child abuse. Yeah. And so a lot, of, um, I, a, a lot of issues of neglect actually get reported as abuse okay. or they're, you know, the, the category of neglect is very broad and it's not very well explained. And most of the training programs that train mandated reporters, people like teachers, hospital workers, clinic people, those trainings are like an hour long and yeah. maybe they do it once a year. Yeah. And so the focus is not really on, let's show you all the possibilities, and these are the possibilities that are definitely child abuse. This is definitely severe neglect that should be reported. Yeah. This is neglect that's really like, oh, the kid's coming in every day with dirty clothing, or you know, has bad teeth, or you know, its hair isn't done, or you know, whatever. There, there are degrees, right? Yeah. So, a lot of folks see these problems presenting in a child and suspect abuse when it's really a matter of poverty, yeah, yeah. of um, needing certain services that haven't been available to them or maybe they don't know about. So that's one of the, one of the things that we're concerned with is making sure that those children who are really substantiated reports of child abuse, mm -hmm. that we uh, really attend to those kids and take the pressure off child welfare to be investigating all these, I mean the difference, let me just run the numbers by you. Yeah, please. Right now, the allegations of mistreatment in Humboldt County run around 92.9 uh, .9 per thousand children. Wow, that's a lot. That so those are the reports. Oh, those yeah, are yeah. people calling in reports of abuse. Yeah, yeah. And the California number, the state number, is 49 per 1,000 children. Okay. So we're pretty much, up there in double category, right? Yeah, yeah. That's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, substantiation, I mean, on its face, you would think, oh my God, children in Humboldt are suffering. Yeah. And they probably are, but yeah. not from severe yeah. child neglect. Yeah, exactly right. Um, the substantiation rates, okay, get ready for it, 8.7. Wow. Okay, so the allegations are up around 92.9 and 8.7 is the number that actually gets substantiated. So one-tenth of basically the reports-ish. Yeah. I mean, and exactly. it's 5.4 at California level. So, wow. um, there, and we're doing some things at CAPC, as is the state of California, actually, to look at mandated reporter trainings and the problem that overreporting is causing. Yeah. Because if you've got all these social workers are busy running around investigating these situations that hardly ever get substantiated, obviously you're not putting those people on the the big deals. There's yeah. not enough people to go around to do the really important work of dealing with real child abuse. things that maybe aren't really uh, abuse to begin with. Right. And that, so people need to know how to differentiate better, perhaps. And there are people out there in families who could use services that we have in this county. I mean, am I right? We have so many services in this county, but so few people actually know about them and there's stigma associated with seeking services. Yeah. So we're about trying to educate. I mean, CAPC is an organization. We are made up of many different service-providing organizations, like uh, um, CASAS. 
court appointed special advocates, changing tides, yeah, well, uh, family so, services. Uh, before we were talking before the show, Cindy, you've been uh, with um, CAPC for more than 20 years, right? Correct, yeah. yes. So I appreciate that and I want to thank you for, for oh, that service because yeah. I think it's really important. Um, but also, I mean, we were talking before the show, um, sort of, can you explain for us, um, yeah, what we were just talking about. Which <laughs> so CAPSI is a coordinating council. Yeah. Our board is made up of probably about 14 or 15 different direct service providing organizations that provide prevention services at some level, whether it's primary prevention or prevention or secondary prevention. And one of the things we try to do at our board meetings well, no, we don't try, is to make sure that services are being uh, provided both equitably, in other words, there aren't particular populations that are unable to access those services because of either economic status or other things that could be prohibitive, yeah. um, and that they're um, provided geographically throughout the county, because one of the things that's a big challenge here in Humboldt is we're a big county geographically. Yeah. We got like, a lot of square miles and we have little itty bitty populations and centers, you know, towns all over the place. And it's really difficult for service providers to be able to go to all of those places. Yeah. And how do we get families, say in Bridgeville, into a parent training program for parents of adolescents? Yeah. And one of the ways we're looking at this is to be able to provide services using technology. COVID kind of taught us something yeah. across the nation, and that sure. is you don't necessarily have to be sitting in the room with your service provider face to face. You could be on Zoom. I do have my interviews on Zoom now. <laughs> See, there you go. <laughs> the world anyway, changed with COVID. Right, yeah. so we're, yeah. we're, we're trying to do a shift in, in, in culture, but CAPSI, again, looks for those areas. If there's gaps in services, how can those be filled? and ways to be able to support organizations to fill those gaps, to do that early prevention work, yeah. so that families don't rise to the level where a substan an allegation turns into a substantiation yeah. within child welfare. Now, Jan, I have done documentaries in the past about addiction, um, and I have addiction in my own story, and it's something I've been open about and I've covered on this show and several others. Um, when I was researching the documentary, they talked about uh, adverse childhood experiences and how that kind of feeds into the addiction problem and that there's a cycle that goes on where people who are addicted tend to raise kids who have more aces and so it's a cycle, right? And um, so could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the abuse problem in Humboldt County and is the high numbers of addiction, uh, rates of addiction correlated with abuse, do you think? Or what are your thoughts on that? And then more broadly on how aces impact our community. You know, I don't have the ex I don't have all those numbers with me today, numbers, but I can say, numbers, yeah. you know, I I appreciate you're making the connection because uh, that came up when you were um, doing the intro too. That ACEs is not just something that we want to screen for and detect in children. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we want to identify it early and get those children services that they need to deal with the trauma that they may be experiencing. But it's also to 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 actually screen the adults that um, really need to understand the way that their experience has impacted their own lives yeah. and their um, substance use. It is a big issue. And yeah. even, you know, even in the, um, there are a lot of neglect cases where the parents are sure. involved in substance use and that's causing neglect. And it's just, like you said, it's a cycle that's hard to break out of unless you have some kind of intervention. Mm -hmm. And um, intervention is always a tricky thing, especially with substance use. As you well know, it has to be the person who... Decides um, that they want to make the change. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I feel like part of our work as CAPC is focused on educating parents and the community at large uh, in the, um, the language of ACEs and yeah. what it really means to have, you know, I mean, one of the aces is, uh, you know, have you ever had a, a parent uh, incarcerated? Um, have you had a parent who is mentally ill? Have you had a parent who is, are, are you in a household that has domestic violence? Yeah. Now, while in itself domestic violence is not a reason for removal of a child from a family, if you combine that with substance use, and these are things that probably child welfare people should be talking about, not me, but, yeah, yeah. but generally, 
there are, you know, those are considerations are, that go into a decision about whether or not the child's safe in a home. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so what what we're hoping is that if we can bring more of an education to parents through parenting courses, through um, education about ACEs and other, um, you know, child development. What what you know? So how many people are having children who've actually been? through any kind of a training program. Yeah, I mean, you have to train to drive a car. Yeah, you exactly. don't have to train to have a you child. You need a license to breed. <laughs> right, <yeah>. exactly. <laughs> and they don't give you a manual at the hospital. <laughs> they don't. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have to say, I'm going to come clean. I do not have my own children. <laughs> so it's really easy for me to talk about what other people should be doing with their children. <laughs> but I do know, as a person with high ACEs, actually, that yeah. um, that I know the effects of child abuse, and that's why I do this work, yeah. largely. Um, and I've seen it in my family as well. Um, and it's been uh, really meaningful for me to be involved in these conversations um, with other people who are devoted to this in the community as well. Some of our members were at the Board of Soups meeting last, uh, t on Tuesday. Because it, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. I want to make sure to get that in there, which I forgot to That's say. That's right. Yeah. Yes, and I didn't bring the proclamation with me. It's in a bulletin board over the clinic in <laughs> public health. But um, <laughs> anyway, the proclamation was that April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. And um, there was someone from First Five there, uh, Marianne Hansen, and uh, she's one of our big uh, members and supporters and movers and shakers. And she's been with the organization forever, too. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Carrie Venegas from Changing Tides. And, you know, there were a couple of people who came out to make comments about their personal experience with some stuff. And um, afterward, I was so impressed that the th three of us were standing there talking and a person from the community came up and asked us some questions. And we took the time, I'm not pinning a medal on myself, yeah. but I was like so impressed that we professionals, quote unquote, mm -hmm. we took the time to stand there and like listen to this person's story and mm -hmm. think of ways that we could help them, uh, you know, go s legal aid or, you know, some other organization, victim witness perhaps. We yeah. kind of put our heads together and said, how can we help this individual? Yeah, yeah. And that was just, you know, that's the work that we do every day, right? Yeah. And then, and then the CAPC is kind of the high level work that we do where we're all trying to talk about, like Cindy said, where are the gaps in services? What do we need to be looking at now? And one of the things we're looking at now is that maltreatment and, al and the allegations versus substantiations. I think that's a big um, direction to go in the future because one of the things we're trying to promote is we have to get information out there in the community in Spanish as well as English yeah. to, to explain where people can go for services and not have their kids taken away, yeah. right? They can go in and talk about to the family resource centers. We've got family, how many? 16. We have 16 family resource centers <laughs> across the county. And then wow. there are um, Native American um, tribal uh, agencies too who are involved yeah. in these family resource centers that are spread out. Yeah. And we are, uh, CAPC has very much supported. We actually, a bunch of us, got together a subcommittee and some of the people I just mentioned mm -hmm. were on there to develop the um, comprehensive prevention plan for the county. Mm -hmm. And we were among the first in the state to come up with an approved, right? Prevention yeah, we were thing? number seven. Okay, that's pretty high up there. Yeah, yeah. So um, we got our prevention plan in and part of that plan is to support and uh, strengthen services in these family resource centers so that there are referrals. And our tribal social service and offices, our tribal of which we have three, as well as the Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Collaborative, HCTC. Thank you. Who serve. So we have 20 sites yeah. throughout the county. Now, one of the things that we were talking about before the show also was that difference between, you know, what's reportable and what's enforceable um, with abuse. And you had said that if people visit the website, there yes. might be ways for them to learn how to better distinguish yes. between what's reportable and what's not. And the website is capsihumboldt.org. Um, there it is on the screen so people can see it at home. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what people might find at the website and what some sort of broad strokes ways to differentiate between what might be abuse and what might be not? So one of the pages on our website says how to report abuse. And you click on that and it takes you to a separate page which has a link to something called the Child Protection Reporting Guide. We've been very excited about this guide. It's a um, decision logic tree that works you through 
whether or not what you've seen or witnessed is actually child abuse as child welfare services would define it and then result in an investigation. Or it's not, but it gives you all kinds of information, the definitions that are in the welfare and institution codes. It's, it's just a really great tool to use. And it explains the use of the tool on our webpage, and then there's the link to it. You click on it, it takes you right to that place. Yeah. You can make the report from that site, mm -hmm. um, but if it says, no, this wouldn't actually be uh, abuse, then there's a link to resource guides. So you can then find an agency to address the issue that you experience what you saw, yeah. and you can provide that information to the family and refer the family directly to the service provider yeah. instead of child welfare services. Yeah. Now, Jan, one of the things that I've noticed in a lot of the stories that I've covered over the years with a lot of local government entities, and there, you know, there, there's just a lot of bureaucracy in a lot of different ways, especially around important issues because people want to see them addressed. But siloing becomes a problem where you have individual organizations who have their responsibility and don't necessarily look without outside of their purview, it sounds like what CAPC is doing is sort of taking a more global view of the issue generally and trying to help coordinate um, all these different organizations to be more effective. Is, is that fair? I think that's fair. I think, uh, I think because of our particular uh, charter that we are, you know, the work that we're charged with, it, it is basically focused on uh, child abuse prevention, but you know, broadly defined, like you said, the primary and secondary causes, um, I mean, there could be a whole conversation on that. Yeah. Um, but primary prevention is when you try, it's way upstream. It's what a lot of public health programs do, right? Yeah. So we have nurse family partnership and safe yeah. care. So all what's, what's the value programs. in prevention versus uh, inter intervention? Well, can I tell you what the value is? Yes, you can. Actually, there's, a, there's an organization <laughs> called Safe and Sound out of San, San Francisco, and uh -huh. um, they have uh, produced the financial impacts of child abuse over the last five, six years. They've been working on this wow. project. The, 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 the financial impact of the 226 verified survivors of abuse and neglect in Humboldt County, that's kids who have been in the foster system, mm -hmm. is $70,400,000. Million wow. That is um, just for the 226 verified survivors. That's a, you know, a, a current. Um, so that's like the lifetime expense, cost, cost right. to us as a society. Because of health issues or societal impacts from things that result from the, their, their, the abuse that they suffered and how it impacted right. the Right, lifetime community. productivity gets impacted, yeah, yeah. the utilization of high-end expensive services um, around mental health, substance use, um, emergency, res uh, emergency room, hospital care, mm -hmm. all of that gets factored into this calculation. Could you say that figure for us one more time just so people can... $70,400,000 wow. for the 226 people. Wow. And the child welfare cost alone is $2,420,397. <laughs> and, and then there's criminal justice expenses, another two million something, and education. Because a lot of the kids who are in foster care or are even are not in foster care but are subject or they have high A scores, um, but they haven't been notified, you know, identified by yeah, the exactly. officials. They need special education services. You know how expensive that is. Yeah, I'm just a struggle alone to get somebody to get into the special ed system so that they get special services. That's worth some money right there. But that's what you're saying. It's like that's where prevention comes in because mm -hmm. that cost is so massive, and that only accounts for the fiscal impact. Not to mention social stuff right. that we'll never be able to quantify. I mean, the problem can only realistically be solved by tackling it before it actually manifests, right? I mean, so that's the our federal thought. government came out. They did a. They've done a lot of of research on the cost of foster care, and for every dollar the federal government and the federal government is the agency that actually funds foster care throughout the nation, every single state. Yeah. For every dollar that's spent on foster care, there's a negative return of almost $10, a negative return. Wow. In other words, this is not where we wanna be spending our money, yeah, our yeah. taxpayer dollars. Yeah. We wanna spend our taxpayer dollars in prevention because it's so less expensive yeah. and it has a way of lowering 
these figures like Jan's talking about, $70 million. Yeah, and if you lowered those figures, I think you'd see metrics in all kinds of categories start to fall. Exactly. Because this bleeds over into virtually every problem we have as a society. And this is the genesis of a lot of the blight that we're suffering socially um, in this country, I think. Well, and if you look at ACEs, the impact of trauma on human lives is mm -hmm. that they, they can, they've correlated, you know, heart disease and um, certainly substance use disorder, right? But yeah. heart obesity, disease and stroke. And stroke. Obesity. Obesity. obesity, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. the most <laughs> things you would never think <coughs> about 10 years ago are all yeah. like traceable to trauma. Yeah. So if you prevent the trauma, you're good. If you treat the trauma early, you're going to catch up faster, but yeah. you know otherwise it's just going to build on expenses on the way all the way down the yeah, line. Yeah, snowball. Mm -hmm. So the 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 hopefully the argument is that you know we've got these prevention dollars suddenly that are going to be put into strengthening services for families that hopefully will keep them out of foster care, and if we can prove that that's effective, mm -hmm. then we can take that to argue for more preventive services. And you know, there's a, there's a figure that I don't know the equivalent of, but preventive services have a positive return that's unbelievable too. Yeah. I mean, that just in the opposite of In the opposite the, direction, yeah. yeah. Um, we are, have two minutes left in the show, and there are two events that I wanted to plug for you guys. Um, we have the Children's Memorial, um, Save the Date, Boys and Girls Club at the Redwoods Teen Center, 9 a.m. Friday, April 26, 2024. If people go to this, what are they going to see? Um, so we have a little ceremony every year where we meet at the Boys and Girls Club. And the, um, the ultimate goal is to we celebrate and we commemorate. Mm -hmm. So we're celebrating people in the community who have stood out in their work to prevent child abuse or to serve children's needs children in the community awards, like, yeah. and we give them certificates we recognize their their work and then the other thing we do is we talk about new things that might be coming up in child welfare that address child prevention uh, abuse prevention and the ultimate is that we raise this flag to commemorate those children who've been lost yeah. uh, to violence in child abuse that is tragic but a great um, event it sounds like and then we have the centering our families save the date event 8 30 so you save the date is just for telling people we to save do that. the date yeah <laughs> yeah i'm sorry <laughs> no, centering our okay. families uh 8 30 to 8 30 to 4 30 on may 15th and um it's at the fortuna river lodge yep right and so this is centering our families and mm. we are going to have a panel in the morning of parent partners and parent navigators, people who work for organizations and agencies because they have experience working their child through whatever that system of care is. And they act as navigators for other parents coming in. And then in the afternoon, we're having another panel of the organizations that actually hire parent partners so that we have parent voice at the table for both program development and ongoing evaluation. In other words, making sure that people are getting what they need. Thank you guys very much for all the work you do. We're out of time. I told you it would go fast, and it always does. But thank you guys. That's all for this evening. Stay tuned. Stay informed.